I'm Lynn Epstein in the Department of Plant Pathology, and it's a real pleasure today to introduce Professor Jim Tichy, Tichy from uh, Michigan State University. Professor T.G. got his bachelor's from Iowa State. He was raised in the Midwest in agronomy and then his master's and Ph.D. at Cornell University with a major in soil microbiology and a minor in biochemistry. 1968, after he got his Ph.D., he went to Michigan State University as an assistant professor and has remained there. Uh, he's currently the university distinguished professor in the departments of crop and soil sciences and microbiology and molecular genetics. And he's also director of the Center for Microbial Ecology, which is an NSF center. Dr. TG has a long distinguished career of professional service and awards. I'll just mention a few. He's a long-standing member of the DOE Biological and Environmental Science Research Advisory Committee. In 2004-2005, he was president of the American Society for Microbiology. He's a fellow of the American Association for uh, the Advancement of Sciences, and he's elected to the uh, U.S. National Academy of Sciences. So it's a real honor that he's here today, and his topic is Genomes, Unraveling Species in Ecology of Microbes. It's a pleasure to be here. I would say that uh, Lynn was a graduate student at Michigan State, and I was on her committee. <laughs> and it was the first graduate student committee that I was on whose undergraduate major was English. <laughs> but I would mention to the faculty that that's good because the thesis is well written. <laughs> so I've been to Davis a few times. Uh, the first time I was here was the day after Proposition 13 election. And the audience was very somber. Now, for the graduate students here, you probably know nothing about what I'm speaking. But some of the faculty probably remember uh, that day and its impact on education in California. But you've survived. The second time I was here, was a much better day. I picked up the USA Today <coughs> newspaper outside of my room, and my wife was quoted on the front page. <laughs> and she didn't even know it. I called her to tell her. So I've had uh, several experiences at Davis, and uh, I'll see what is memorable this time. I think the rainbow yesterday was one memorable event. So I'm going to talk today about uh, genomics and what we can learn from genomics that help us understand species in bacteria, if there are such, and more about the ecology of organisms. And my interest all along has been in microbial ecology. In fact, I sort of grew up with the field of microbial ecology. So uh, that's my interest. So I try to interpret everything about microbes in an ecological context. And I think the genomics area is a very attractive one uh, for helping us in that regard. So I'm going to talk uh, in three topic areas. One, about genomes and what it might tell us about species. And then I'm going to talk about one example organism that we work with, which is the Burkholderia. Used to be Pseudomonas, right, John? And then I'm going to talk about ecological patterns of Burkholderia in the end to bring back in the ecology. So these are what I would say are some major questions in microbial ecology as I see today. So one is, are there clusters, in other words, real species, of related microbes in the microbial world? And if so, what defines these clusters? What are the habitat gene relationships that really determine a microbe's ecology? And finally, most microbial processes involve microbial communities. And who comprises those communities? In what manner are they arranged and why? So those I consider some of the big questions facing uh, understanding the microbial world today. So this is my view of the microbial world. So a sphere, a world, with three basic dimensions. The one on the right hand side is the breadth of the microbial world. In other words, the diversity of the microbes that make up uh, this planet. And I was at a uh, uh, American Academy of Microbiology workshop that last fall, and we were asked, we were specifically asked by the sponsor to tell us how many microbial species they are. 
There are. So what at least my group came up with is somewhere between 10 to the 7th to 10 to the 23rd. <laughs> the 20, 10 to the 23rd comes from the fact that they're now about, they're estimated about 10 to the 29th or 10 to the 30th microbes on Earth. And if you consider the time and the speciation, well, 10 to the 23rd might be a reasonable upper bound. But it points out the difficulty we have with that uh, particular number when, in fact, we don't know really what a species is. Uh, another dimension is depth. So what do we understand about microbes at some depth? which would come from model organisms. So it's the molecular detail of representative organisms. And if we understand depth of some of these organisms, then we can extend outward with breadth. And then the third dimension is the environment. How those microbes and their signaling mechanisms interact with the environment. So if we fill in this space, we will understand the microbial world. And for students, that's a huge opportunity for the future, because that's a big job. So we will be at that for some time. And I've always considered the microbial world to be the unexplored reservoir of diversity on Earth, because we know so little about the microbial world. So how large is the microbial world? Well, we do know something about ribosomal sequences, and that's become a very popular technique to at least begin to understand components of the microbial world. And uh, uh, since about 1988, or, sorry, 1998, MSU has managed the ribosomal database after uh, Carl Woese transferred it to us. And this is how it's uh, grown. So the number right there is actually a November number. I checked this morning, and as of February 1st, there were 3,300, or 303,000 ribosomal sequences in the ribosomal database. And there's no sign that uh, we're uh, at approaching a plateau at the ribosomal sequence level in microbial diversity. So one of the things we looked at a few years ago was uh, genome size and particular categories of functions that were represented uh, with genome size. Now, as some of you will know, that uh, people have looked at some time uh, on the smaller size microbial genomes. And what happens when a microbial genome becomes smaller, usually in an intracellular or parasite or some type of obligate pathogen, but not on the larger side. So we took, at the lar took a look at the larger side, and this was, uh, at that time, some 160 uh, microbial genomes. And you can see th along the bottom axis is the genome size in this direction up to uh, 10 megabases. And these are the COGS categories, as you can see. So these are the informational categories, these are the cellular process categories, and these are metabolism categories. So you can see there is definitely a trend with larger genome size. So uh, uh, in these uh, transcription, signal transduction, secondary metabolism, energy production and conversion, which is also metabolism, and cell motility, the dispersion is high here. These increase with genome size. And my point here on the ecology side is these patterns must reflect ecological selection. So larger genomes have a purpose and they are accumulating genes of certain types that gain that purpose. And this is throughout all microbial uh, groups. So it says, in general, that metabolism and control of that metabolism is important for genomes, uh, at least organisms in particular niches, and uh, then accumulate genes that help them in that dimension. Now, a little bit about species. So, the current species definition is this. Operationally, it's when two strains belong to the same species when their purified DNA molecules show at least 70% reassociation during hybridization. And you must have a diagnostic phenotype 
So at least the practitioner of microbiology has a chance of determining the species. So that's the species definition from the Wayne paper of 1987. It was a definition by committee, especially a committee that was experienced with enteric organisms. It said, well, 70% DNA cor hybridization corresponds to what we think uh, might, a species might be in terms of related phenotype. But it wasn't tested much beyond that. Uh, uh, so operationally, it's this definition. But actually, the paper says that when or implies that when better methods are available to evaluate the gene content, those would, um, would be used instead of DNA-DNA hybridization. So this is the DNA-DNA reassociation method. You isolate the DNA, you fragment it, you denature it, you mix and you renature, and then you quantify the uh, heteroduplex formation relative to the homo duplex. And so in the 1980s, this was, a, this was about what you could do with molecular methods to try to better understand relationships at the gene level between organisms. It's not been a popular method, however, because it's very difficult to do. You've got to do all these pairwise comparisons. People hate to do it. Uh, so we need something else. So. It has shortcomings, which I pointed out. The main one being is it can't be data-based, and it's very hard to do. Uh, so instead, we've tended to use 16S ribosomal sequence. Uh, however, the ribosomal molecule is too conserved to really resolve at the species level. But nonetheless, uh, we try to use it. At the genus and above level, it works pretty well, and I'll say more about that in a moment. So what we took a look at was basically simply this, a reciprocal bias match of a reference genome to a tester genome with this criteria. And we've evaluated different criteria here, but it doesn't make a big difference. 60% of the identity over 70% of the length of the query ORF at the nucleotide level. And then we can get conserved genes by this definition. And we can normalize, or we can determine the percent of the conserved genes as a part of the total to normalize for the genome size effect. And importantly, then we can calculate an average nucleotide identity for those conserved genes, which we call ANI, or abbreviated as ANI, average nucleotide identity. And we consider this then a measure of evolutionary distance. And the next slide I'll show how we evaluated that. So first of all, DNA-DNA hybridization is the standard. And this is the average nucleotide identity. So we compare these data or perform these data on sequenced genomes, and it follows this type of relationship here. So the 70% DNA-DNA hybridization corresponds to about an average nucleotide identity of 95%. On the right-hand side, is, is what I consider most important, and that's how the ANI compares to the whole genome um, phylogeny. So we took all of the conserved genes of these genomes, concatenated them, and then uh, determined uh, their phylogeny um, as indicated here. And we had different sets of organisms. Some are illustrated in color here. And you can see up to a, a certain level, there's a good relationship between A and I and the uh, whole gene phylogeny. So we consider this a good, a good predictor of the phylogenetic uh, distance. It's important uh, because it provides better resolution than the 16S gene. And over here, you can see the A and I compared to 16S. Uh, it was at least at the time we had done this, that there is a relationship, but it's not uh, as, uh, as uh, directly related as over here. Then in the lower right-hand side, we see ANI compared to the percent of the genes conserved between a pair of genomes compared. And you can see as this uh, ANI distance uh, decreases 
then it's predictive of a decline in the number of conserved genes over a large distance. But this is the current species cutoff here at about 94, 95 percent, and you can see that within a species there is considerable um, diversity in terms of gene content. And I also put here uh, the man versus chimpanzee comparison as a reference point in, for species comparisons. Now that last figure that I've just shown you is this one right here. And I pointed out that there was a lot of variation between what we currently call a species. So that portion is blown up here. So this is the average nucleotide identity and this is the percent of genes conserved between a pair of genomes. And there are two sets of data points on here. The filled boxes are all genes compared. The open boxes are those, only those in the COGS database are not associated with mobile elements. So these would be more suspect genes as having um, value to the organism. They may still have value. It's, but some of them may not. But these are, or, sorry, these would be the ones that would not be so suspect because they're in COGS and they're not mobile. And this is all of the genes. And if, then if we draw the relationship here, you can see then the R squared value is pretty low on both of those. This is for all genes and this line is for uh, the uh, better characterized genes. Then if we look at some of those at the same evolutionary distance, this set here for example, so they vary a lot, these pairs of organisms vary a lot in their uh, common gene content. So some of these, uh, some e, e. coli is down here for example, here's some other E. coli strains, uh, Bordetella is here. So these may reflect in fact organisms uh, that are in the same species, well, currently in the same species, but actually have a different ecology. So it may be unresolved what is the real ecology of these particular organisms. But if we look at the ones up here at the top, here we see a much greater evolutionary divergence in nucleotide sequence, but yet they're keeping the same gene content. So we have uh, one that some of you are interested in here is a xylella pair up here. We also are here and here we have a helicobacter, here we have campylobacter, and here is staphylococcus for example. So this suggests that the same ecology is forcing the same gene content while the sequence divergence continues. So what this figure shows then is that there is substantial gene diversity at the current subspecies level, the currently named species level, and suggests that maybe within the currently named species we're including too much um, diversity. Also, we're not recognizing ecology at all, and ecology appears to play an important, fact, or an important role on the conserved gene core, and thus definitions based solely on evolutionary distance are problematic. Now if we take a look at um, these species, and this is well characterized species according to the 70 percent criteria for which there are the most genomes sequenced, and at the time we did this, which was uh, more than a year ago, there were 21 E. coli genomes sequenced. I think there are now over 30 sequenced, so we're really getting good coverage there. So this is the number of new genomes added, and this is the conserved DNA in, uh, not in kilobases. And this is, uh, in, this is whether or not the gene is in the next species sequenced. So the original one was the E. coli sacchii strain, it has about 5,000 genes. Uh, the next most closely related one sequenced then would have, together they would only have 3,700. And as you see, each new one sequenced, then the core declines somewhat. If we say that they're in all the in all of the other strains sequence except one, then it becomes this number right here, and all but two, it becomes this right number right here. So to summarize on the right-hand side, 
Good. Now I also point out here, then this is the total unique DNA uh, added for each particular organism. So this is the additive total then of the new genes being explored by E. coli with each genome sequenced. Then the summary is uh, the on the size on average would be about five megabases. The core might have about 3,000 genes somewhere in here. Each new genome would add 300 more genes. And so far, 16,000 genes are explored by E. coli. And uh, Claire Fraser and the Tiger Group published a paper on a different organism, but they call this then the pan genome, the genes explored by um, a particular organism group. And of course, the interest in question is, you know, whether this actually ever does completely flatten out or it continues. So I expect it doesn't, but I expect maybe not 300 new genes in when you add the 50th uh, organism to E. coli. Now, back to um, the diversity of the microbial world. So we also calculated, if we did AAI, we could do, or ANI, we could do AAI, average amino acid identity. And the reason we would do this is because then we can go greater phylogenetic distances. So we did this at the time with 176 closed genomes, the full matrix of these comparisons, and then could draw a phylogenetic tree. So this is that tree. These are the bacteria here. Uh, here's some eukaryotes in here, and down here are the archaea. And I'll call your attention to this pink group down here. So that's us. So uh, that's rat, mice, human for example, and those are the branch links there. So you can see why they were more closely related to our mammal friends in terms of the average amino acid uh, comparison than, our, than is most of the microbial world. So all phyla, all what we consider the bacterial phyla, and several classes are as deeply uh, branching as the archaea. So while we consider the archaea certainly a, distinct, a distinctive group, there are other groups as deeply branching as that. So that further illustrates the uh, diversity in the microbial world. Now if we take the AAI value, which is this value here, and here we calculate the, the 16S uh, ribosomal gene identity compared to AAI. And you see it does form this pattern shown here, if we take all of those genomes. This being the species cut off up here. So to point out a couple things with 16S sequence, you can see that at this species level, in some cases even genus level, that the 16S is not very resolving because this, conserve, this curve gets very flat here. Doesn't mean that 16S is bad, it means that, you know, as you try to push it towards this end, you're, it's more risky. Also, it's interesting down here is you have a lot of 16S resolution, but at the amino acid level, you don't. So while you're getting good uh, evolutionary information for the, at, at least from that molecule, it's not reflecting much at the amino acid level, the functional gene level. Now the other figures here are simply to show uh, how the current classification places organisms on this uh, matrix. Uh, and all I'll just all I'll point out is that where the clusters of color are the same, that means things fit a molecular phylogeny. But you can see the red spots here fall all over the place. So there is clearly a higher level taxonomy that is, is not well reflected in in molecular phylogeny uh, in that case. And here you can see some, also some outliers in, in yellow over here. So this is, then it can be a useful guide in the future to better understand uh, phylogenetic relationships in the microbial world. Oh, so, okay, to, so to conclude on this part, I would say that uh, genomics provides a revolutionary insight into speciation and that reflects the evolution, the ecology, and the phenotype. 
If species is to suggest an organism's phenotype and habitat as it does for higher organisms, then currently named species are probably more equivalent to genus. And ecotypes may be more closely related to species. And uh, though I don't consider myself a, a sort of core, core in the microbial systematics uh, world, this, I mean, uh, not necessarily this information, but from other points of view, uh, people have the same, coming to the same kind of conclusion. The microbial world reflects its ancient ancestry of 3.8 billion years, and hence not all species should follow, follow the same model. In other words, as they have strategized to meet their ecological constraints, they can do it in different ways. And so we shouldn't expect some precise definition for one to apply to the entire microbial world. And while I won't uh, talk about this, I'll just provide this as uh, what, where, what we think the data shows now, is that there appear to be clusters, species for some bacteria, especially the pathogenic group, but maybe not for others, especially soil organisms. It's very difficult to find any cutoff at the genomic level that would, would define uh, species. This different, uh, difference appears to reflect selection, in other words, the great habitat difference is where those organisms live and thus driving um, their current genetic makeup. Okay, so that's the first part. Now, uh, so I have, uh, for about 10 years, uh, considered uh, microbial ecology to be very similar to astronomy. And I think it's always interesting, you know, to think of analogs in other fields. And originally in microbiology, we were always supposed to think of biochemistry as our analog, and that's fine. But uh, actually, I think that uh, actually during the NSF center years, I came to this uh, uh, position. And that is because we and astronomers have fundamentally the same kind of problem and data set to deal with. So this could be a picture of a microbial community, right? Uh, so why do I say that, we, that we're related? Well, we're both methods driven. We're both limited by methods. And if you talk to any astronomers, their next goal is to build a better instrument to make the next factor of two improvement in what they can measure. And in microbial ecology, we're also trying, always working on new methods to get what we can't get otherwise. We have many, many, ob we have, all, both of us have millions of objects, very faint signals, very hard to distinguish. And we both view things from a distance, from quite a distance. We have to amplify the signal. And most of what we study is unknown to science, has not previously been discovered before. However, we are guided by general concepts on origins, on composition, on patterns. So we have sort of the same larger scale guiding theory. And data analysis is intensive. And for microbial ecology, it's going to become much more intensive, more like ast astronomy. So I think we should interact with astronomers. Now I was at a meeting with an astronomer, or cosmologist actually. Actually, uh, George, this comes from uh, STC Connections. So, and he said to me, he said, we can now measure single electron flux at nanometer scale. Would that have any use to a biologist? And I said, yeah, yeah. What we would like to know about microbes in their natural habitat is something about their metabolic activity. And at the basic level, that's electron flux. So perhaps astronomers can also offer us some methods to advance our understanding of, of the microbial world. So this particular example the astronomers think is fantastic, and I don't know if you've seen this picture, because this is, I understand, one of the first, first direct evidence of dark matter. 
discovered by the Stanford Linear uh, Accelerator Group. So, to students, think about your analogies and how that might help you think more about your problem and uh, where to go in the future. Now, the Burkhold area example. So, uh, so I showed you before the large genomes. And most of those large, all of those large genomes so far are free living organisms. They do it by themselves in nature. And uh, many of them are soil organisms, though I know Jack's organism is also a large organism, large genome organism. But it, it's a nature organism, maybe not. Well, so you told me a soil organism this morning. Yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm thinking something about soil is definitely selecting for large genomes. And we think it's versatility. So Burkhold area, the former pseudomonad, it colonizes a, a wide variety of habitats. So it's definitely in soil. The, the easiest place to find it is in a rhizosphere of a grassy plant, especially maize. Some also colonize streams and occupy water environments. They're particularly problematic in lungs of cystic fibrosis patients, and, and, and that's generally fatal. Uh, some are pathogenic on plants. And many of you are plant pathologists, and you know their Burkholaria sapatia is the original type strain. It rots onions. Uh, some are good biocontrol agents for root disease. Some are biothreat agents. Two were weaponized in World War I. So what is it with this organism that can do all these different things? They're all, so they have among the largest bacterial genomes. Uh, they're among the best pollutant degraders, and that's how we got started. And the best known PCB degraders in this group, and I'll say a bit more about it, and the best TC co-oxidizers in this group. They're known to degrade a wide variety of substrates, some over 200 substrates, and the amount of oxygenases in these genomes are huge. I think between uh, dioxygenases and oxygenases, there's over 100 annotated in the Burkhold era I'm going to talk about. Most fixed nitrogen, which was not recognized before, and of the environmental strains, we did a survey of environmental strains, and I think it's about 94% of all of the Burkhold area environmental isolates fixed nitrogen. And I was told by the Brazilian scientists that if you plant a common bean in the Cerrado region of Brazil, 70% of the nodules will be only Burkhold area fixing nitrogen. So it does a lot of things. It's a beta proteobacteria, but it can't grow anaerobically, or very well anaerobically at least. That's the only thing it can't do. So how can it do all these things? What can we learn about it? So we are examining the group at different levels of evolutionary distance using genomics. And we start, so that's the 16S phylogenetic tree over there. And uh, so Burkhold area, its next closest relative is Ralstonia. And the pathologists will know Ralstonia. And it's organized much in the same way as Ralstonia. So Burkhold area, Cenocepatia, the original genotype 2, or gen genome of R2, is the one that is, is the most uh, problematic in cystic fibrosis patients. And so that's why the medical group focused on that first. And the first sequence of this group was this strain J2315, which is the epidemic strain in cystic fibrosis patients in the UK and Northeast Canada. Uh, and we have uh, through JGI sequence three more strains. AU1054, uh, which is the epidemic strain in cystic fibrosis patients in the U.S. Uh, Mid-Atlantic region. HI2424 is a soil strain from New York that the clinicians cannot distinguish from this strain. And MCO3 is a strain from uh, Michigan from the corn rhizosphere. In the last one sequence, and we chose it because it falls between the other two. So we have genome sequences now of two of the pathogenic strains and two of the environmental strains. Now, well, the medical side 
wants to know virulence factors, they can compare it to the environmental strain. I want to know the soil, well, they say pathogenicity islands. I want to know the soil ecology islands. So I need their strains for comparison. Okay, now this is the, again, to the ANI and the percent conserved DNA. And if we put then the, the, the comparison pairs on here, you see this AU1054 and HI, those are the, this is the pathogen, this is the soil strain. Uh, at the ANI level, they're essentially identical and their gene content is very similar to, I'll say a little bit more about that. But the US strain and the UK pathogenic strain are very dissimilar, actually at the species boundary. And this MCO strain from the corn rhizosphere would fall in the middle. These are uh, the relationship among the strains in the Burkholeria Cepatia complex, the 10 species that form the complex, all of which are found in cystic fibrosis patients, but at lower frequency. But uh, I think all of them are found in rhizospheres as well. Uh, this is their relationship to each other. So you see at the gene content, they're quite dissimilar. I mean, they have only 60% common gene content. And here is the BCC versus Malii and Pseudomalii, which were the weaponized strains. So they're also very dissimilar from the BCC. And this is the PCB degrading strain that I'll talk more about here, and it's very dissimilar from all of these. And the reason this kind of information is important, certainly to me, is then people, then I can make an argument about how dissimilar my strains are to, especially these weaponized strains, which are on the uh, restricted list. Because, I mean, at this level of difference, this is huge difference, you know. I mean, just because it has the same first name doesn't mean that it's a, going to be an obvious pathogen. Now, if we do these kind of comparisons in conserved DNA versus ANI to other sets of organisms, and we also work a lot on uh, the Schuonella group, which falls here in the green, but I won't say any more about it today. And this is the enteric group for which there are a lot of genomes. And we draw this relationship here. You see that the Burkholderia line is steeper, and that is, um, statistically significant, that steeper line. It suggests that at the same evolutionary distance at the nucleotide level, that it's turning over genes faster than these other sets of organisms. And this goes back to what I say about, um, there, I think there really are differences in the microbial world in how they have organized themselves to meet their environmental needs. And for Burkholderia, turning over genes faster Maybe a good strategy, and they have a mechanism that allows them to do that compared to the other organisms. Now, this goes back to the three Cenocepatia strains that are different. So, this is a soil strain that's very similar to the US epidemic strain. And you can see here that, uh, and, it, in, and this is the UK epidemic strain, and this is the ones that they share in common, but you see only 57. 57 of those are shared by the U.S. epidemic strain. This is the recently uh, sequenced strain from corn, or from the Michigan corn. So, uh, so it shows the differences in the normal Venn diagram, but the point I want to point out is then even for a species, 5,000 of about 8,000 genes are in common. So that's a huge difference within one well-characterized uh, species group. If we do this comparison and go all the way and go down to uh, the genus level, then we get only about 2,500 genes. So only about a quarter of the genes in the genus are in common uh, throughout the Burkholderia genus. And you can find pseudomonads, for example, with more genes in common than the Burkholderia genus core. Okay, so uh, what about the conserved core for the Burkholderia cepatia connect complex genome? So what we've done here is taken all of the ones in the BCC. These are the COGS categories here, information, cellular, metabolism, uh, and poorly characterized. 
and then compared those to all of the other larger genomes in the database to see how Burkholderi Cepatia is varying from all of the other genomes. So uh, these are the categories that are enriched in uh, the BCC complex, transcription, carbohydrate transport and metabolism, amino acid transport and metabolism, lipid uh, transport and metabolism. So the metabolism genes and their control, presumably, are enriched in this group of organisms. And what declines is replication, recombination, repair, and the poorly characterized, not assignable uh, to COGS. So it gives us a feel then for how this organism is shifting its composition to meet its ecological needs. Uh, so I'll say a little bit about the Burkholderia xenovorans, uh, which is the PCB degrading strain that we um, sequenced. It, as well as the Ralstonia, are organized into usually three replica replicons. So this we call the core genome. It's about five megabases, so it's E. coli size, already large size. This we call the lifestyle, and this the individuality replicon. Uh, the circles here, the outside circles, are COGS groups. The next circles are the next most, or whether or not the gene is in common with the next most closely uh, related genome. The, the important point is the amount of color in these different circles. You see the core genome has a lot more color. So it says the core genome is, is, is conserved throughout the group. The lifestyle is not so conserved, and the individuality replicon not at all. So the very, there's a lot more variation going on here. We, in fact, would consider this, these replicons as breadboards for evolution. They contribute to the faster turnover of genes, storing the extra, extra genetic material for pop possible use uh, later. This is the uh, in silico comparison of these genomes. Uh, with, the, be, with them becoming more evolutionary distance as you go in this direction. So if you look at where the, the colors are in common, you can see sort of a line like this. As you become evolutionarily more distant than the other gene, this is chromosome one in this region, chromosome two in the megaplasma, the smaller chromosome over here. So you can see it also in the, the synteny of genomes. Now, what about the distribution of functions according to Cox categories for chromosome 1, 2, and the megaplasmid? So chromosome 1 has proportionally more of these features, which would be the core features. Chromosome 2 now is shifted towards more metabolism and control of that metabolism, and the megaplasmid also has those kinds of functions, especially secondary metabolism. So you can see the features then are somewhat shifting with this chromosome structure. Now I said that the Burkholderia metabolized a lot of aromatic compounds. These are the pa pathways that in this particular strain LB400, uh, which was annotated by Michael Siegel's group in uh, Chile, and he says that it has more of the fundamental aromatic pathways than all of the pseudomonads put together, illustrating the, the potential to get at a variety of substrates in nature. Now the last thing I want to say about the Burkholderi is comparison of other members of this particular species. This species is known as Xenovorans because it was the PCB, the best PCB degrader. We have an array to it. We hybridized two other strains to that array. Uh, this is the original PCB degrading strain. The second strain was from a coffee plant rhizosphere in Mexico, and the third was from blood sample of a patient in Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, they all have 70% DNA hybridization. Their GC content is the same. When we hybridize them to their array, uh, this is what we see. So it's yellow if there's competitive hybridization, 
and uh, the other strain is is hybridizing to or competing with LB400. So if we look at chromosome one, we see a lot of yellow, but we see also spots of blue. Down here are the transposons or insertion sequences. So it's pockmarked with uh, insertion sequences. Maybe older, it's been hit, hit more. Chromosome two, however, has much less of those transposon or insertion elements and much more uh, similar within the species. These are all members of the same species. But if we look at the megaplasmid, it's almost entirely different. That's why we say it's the individuality replicon. It distinguishes the individuals within a species. It's also loaded with transposons. So it shows then a different history and a different relationship. And it shows at the species level, in fact, how different phenotype can be. Now, the great PCB degrading ability of this organism is only in strain LB400. None of these others can touch PCB. So that, so that says that you know, species identification does you no good in predicting a particular value like that. So, uh, now, with this larger genome, uh, you've seen the general features that are expanding, and that's metabolism. But there's a lot of functional redundancy at the general level. So it was always known that uh, LB400 could grow on benzoate through the catechol dioxygen pathway as shown here. However, when we have the genome, we see that there's also the CoA pathway as illustrated down here. In fact, two of these pathways that are quite dissimilar at the sequence level. One is on the chromosome. One's on the megaplasmid. So there are three complete pathways for benzoate metabolism, two different biochemistries. We've knocked out each one and two of them. They can grow on benzoate. I mean, any one of these three pathways will allow the organism to grow on benzoate. So that's functional redundancy at that general level. However, at the expression level, and these are different conditions here uh, for both proteomics and transcriptome. But what you can generally see is that the colors aren't the same. So that means the conditions in which they're expressed are not the same. So while it's functionally redundant in the sense that, yes, it provides benzoate growth, it doesn't provide benzoate growth under the same conditions. So in that sense, it, they're potentially all useful for their particular condition. So functionally redundancy is a key in this organism. I think I'm going to go to the last section right now and finish. So a little bit about ecology. So I said Merkel area grow in the rhizosphere. So uh, we looked at several rhizospheres throughout the world. One at the Kellogg Biological Station, which is where the agroecosystem LTER project is, which is in Kalamazoo County, Michigan. And we looked in rhizospheres of wheat, alfalfa, soybean, and maize. This is the, the map of the, uh, the four blocks of the 21 randomly distributed plots with different crops. So that's sort of the sampling area at uh, KBS, which have now been under these treatments since uh, the late 80s. We developed a, a semi-selective method, but a fast screening method to recover Burkhold area, which is illustrated here. So we had a semi-selective medium and we developed a, uh, a 16S uh, probe to screen plates so that we could screen efficiently by colony hybridization and then rapidly screen by both uh, 16S and RecA. RecA is used by the clinical people to type uh, Burkholaria. Uh, and then we could also do, we did uh, uh, MPN PCR and we did DNA extraction and duplex PCR to confirm absence. So we have values on quantity, as well as then isolates that are characterized down to the rec A level. Many of these are Burkholderia ambiferia, especially in uh, grass and certainly in corn, Burkholderia ambiferia is the most frequent. Where in the lungs of cystic fibrosis patients, it's Cenocepatia. So there's clearly a difference uh, between those, those organisms. Then we uh, did whole uh, genome fingerprinting by ERIC-PCR, as indicated here, to uh, 
uh, calculate the percent of genetic similarity between isolates. Uh, and then this is uh, an example of uh, the data patterns as it uh, looks here. But what we were after is to try to understand if there were patterns. So I think one of the big problems in my original goal to, to relay genetic or genomic information to environment is we don't have good ecological information on most of the environmental strains. What we have is it was isolated somewhere, but nothing about how successful it is in that environment, which density would be one thing uh, that probably the first thing that we could easily get. So we were looking at, it, can we evaluate environmental, plant, and spatial components uh, by statistical uh, evaluation? So those would be environmental, plant, and spatial components. Spatial meaning distance, because these were taking a, a long transects. And how much of the variation would be explain, could be explained by those parameters and the interacting components of those parameters and then how much is unexplained at the bottom. So if we take that data using that scheme and we do species abundance, BCC species abundance, you see that the plant is the most significant factor in explaining the data, but it's a lot unexplained. And Befaria abundance was both plant and the interacting components, less unexplained. So it begins to give us a feeling of what is controlling the patterns in the field? Then if we go to the genotypes, the Ambiferia genotypes, then we even have a bigger problem. Here then uh, the spatial component becomes important because it's not at this level, not well mixed spatially, a lot unexplained. Abundance, also a lot unexplained, and genotype similarity. Um, some by the interacting components, but some unexplained. So we think using this, this kind of approach is going to be better helpful in understanding the patterns of populations in the field, and then eventually perhaps that will also relate to the genomic information. Uh, the unexplained variation uh, can be several, one of which is neutral divergence uh, in the genome, which I think is probably a large amount of that variation. So in conclusion then, uh, who did all this work? Certainly not me. So uh, Costas Constantinidis, a graduate student with me for several years, now with Ed DeLong at MIT, did the genomic comparisons. Vincent Deniff, uh, now a uh, postdoc at, uh, uh, with Jill Banfield at Berkeley, did the LB400, uh, a lot of the LB400 genome work. And Albin Ramet, now at the Max Planck Institute, did the uh, spatial patterns that I just talked about. Uh, a number of people have contributed to the overall Burkholderi effort. Uh, certainly the proteomics work was done uh, by the group at the University of British Columbia, Michael Seeger on the aromatic pathways, uh, and two medical people who've, who've helped on their perspective of this group of organisms. Uh, we also have a, a set of work like Burkholderi on Schuonella, which I didn't talk about today. So I would be happy to uh, answer any questions uh, if you have them. Thank you. When you say genes are common and not, what, when you compare genomes, what level of similarity, what cutoffs for similarities do you use? Okay, so that was 60% identity at the nucleotide level over 70% over of the length. So it was the AAI uh, that you compared with the 16S sequence, you said there was not a lot of resolution in the uh, AAIs, whereas you saw a lot of resolution with the 16S RNA. Uh, those AAIs were concatenated uh, that, that's right, the same set of genes that are, would meet the conserved criteria, uh -huh. uh, and then all so the AI calculation. So resolution then is, is could be a, uh, I mean, it's, in principle there's as much information in the protein sequence as the ribosomal RNA sequence, but that loss of resolution is probably the, reflects the 
the uh, currents of horizontal gene transfer uh, that would uh, kind of blur the, the dis differences, and we, don't, and we don't see that with 16SR ribosomal RNA sequences. Yeah. yeah, that could be. Yeah. So we've had uh, discussions, especially with Ford Doolittle, about the horizontal gene transfer aspect. In, in general, with the A and I, we, we feel that it's certainly there, but it's a small number compared to all of the genes. Uh, but it, it's going to vary also with groups, too. Uh, I don't, Costas may have looked at particular groups of organisms that are known to have a higher degree of horizontal transfer to see how that influences the number compared to others. But uh, I, I don't offhand know what that result is. So on most of your, your COG uh, versus large genome size correlations, most of the time there was a direct correlation that as genome size increased, the number of COGs increased. The one exception that was like in a really tight trend line was the COG category J, the upper left-hand corner, yeah. where it almost looked like in the category of transcription, I think, that um, there was a decrease in the COG gene, in the transcription genes as genome size increased, which is sort of counterintuitive. No, no, no it's, it's the percent. Oh, in that category. It's not absolute. Okay. So it does say that those genomes uh, are, they're certain, no, they're not losing essential function. The other thing that was on that figure that's particularly uh, dramatic is that the, the variance around the mean was very little, the least of any. So what it says is, to me, is that that's, those, are, those are highly conserved, but you only need one or so. And it doesn't help you to have two, yeah. Uh, I'm particularly interested in one of the slides that you show one pathogen is the cause of uh, cystic fibro fibrosis and another pathogen is f from the plant side that they are very almost identical in my eyes. Um, did you, do you think that the tra in the transcription level that even they have a lot of genes are conserved but they have different level on the tra transcription? Oh, okay. Uh, we don't know that yet with the Burkholderia set, uh, but, uh, but some of the people in the, the Burkholderia Cepatia working group, uh, uh, Carlos Gon Gonzalez, right, at Texas A&M? Is that right? <laughs> yeah, so he's a plant pathologist, working, but he's working with the medical people because they're trying to see if there's some sim any similarity between the features that he majors from the onion pathogenesis with the uh, medical side. Also, the Burkholderia, uh, so nematode is the model they use too, so some Burkholderia are, will kill nematodes. Uh, and some of these Burkholderia have also been found now inside of fungi, and they will also survive inside of protozoa. So they, they, the at first I didn't, this intercellular habitat I thought was very foreign to them. But now it seems like there's a whole number of cases in which it is common, including the legume nodule. So uh, that feature may aid the plant pathogenesis as well as the human uh, pathogenesis problem. But uh, we actually haven't done yet the transcriptome comparison, which we're going to do, of these four Xenocepatia strains that two from the environment and two from the lung, uh, to see at the, at the regulatory level how the differences compare to the, uh, whole, the genome level. We have done that for the Shuanella. And what I can tell you is that the same patterns, we've done the proteomics on a set of 10 Shuanella for which we have the gene, gene sequence. The, uh, the phylogenetic pattern is, is basically very similar but the differences are much greater. So there's much more difference at the expression level than we saw at the gene content level, which you would expect. Yeah. Um, I'm not a microbiologist, but, but I am a systemist. And um, the, the whole notion of, of the species and, um, and how to think about them, as you emphasized in your talk, is, is, is a fascinating one with, with bacteria, with microbes. And I guess the question I have is, um, given that huge range of the possible number of species, possible number of taxa, um, what do you, as a microbiologist, I mean, what do you, what do you, 
want that species category? What information should it convey to me? I work on metazoans, and I mean, is it, for most people working in metazoans, it's about evolutionary lineages. It's, um, that's kind of a very difficult concept here. Um, what do you want to, what should well, it just reflect percent sequence versions? Or what, what, what do you want to reflect no, biologically? I think, okay, so why, in one respect, why even care about this? And microbiologists haven't cared a whole bunch about it, as long as they can put some kind of a number to tell somebody else what it is, that's it. Uh, but the, the science side is, are there <coughs> fundamental biological forces that form a coherent cluster? And what are the mechanisms that cause that cluster to occur? What I'm suggesting is definitely there are cases of that. And we've looked for some signature sequences that appear in one set and not in the other set, which there should be if there's a core genome and those are contained and these are contained over here. Those tend to be the pathogens so far. If we try to find that in the environmental set, yet we don't see it so much. And, and so that's why I'm saying, well, well, maybe not. But what I think on, on the science side of this question, that what I'm really looking for is the metagenomic information in the future where we sequence communities and then we see what the natural population gene content is that belongs in a cluster. And that will allow us then to see naturally what a species is. And, and uh, what may happen is that's going to be quite different depending on the environment. Some species may en encompass a lot of genetic diversity, including phylogen or evolutionary diversity, but some may be very narrow. And then that... It's all about sort of the functional biology of them in terms of defining species. Yeah, okay, so then what we would like is, is the same thing the public expects of species. If you have a species that it, it tells you something about that, what that organism does and where it can live. And of course, in the microbial world, we have a lot of practical problems. We had a, uh, because species can, if you don't have it right, can get you in jail. Uh, so from the diagnostic to intellectual property to, you know, who's allowed to hold what or ship what, uh, we have those practical side of, of things that are problematic. I hate to cut off the discussion, but thank you very much. Mm -hmm.